Okay, so you will remember that we are in Romans chapter 11. We're going to march on today and um, just briefly uh, touch a few little high highlights and, and move on. Um, so as we began Romans chapter 11, and if you're following along in the book, I'm going to try to say the page numbers as we go along. But right now, I'm just at the beginning of Romans chapter 11. I'm going to point out a couple of things, page 190 in the book. The beginning of this chapter, we learned that there were two main lessons that we were going to glean from this chapter, or we hoped to glean from this chapter. And the first one was that we are not spiritual Israel. And as we read the first two verses of Romans 11, we kind of we kind of learned that because Romans 11 verse 1 and 2 say this, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. That's just the first part of chapter two, I mean, of verse two. But in that first verse and that first part of verse two, we realize that God has not done away with his people and he has not replaced his people. So we understand, and I hope that over the last few weeks, as the lesson has unfolded of this chapter, we've really been able to latch on to that by following through with the, the scriptures by letting the Holy Spirit teach us that which we need to know, that, that which is vital for us to know. Uh, it's our very identity in Christ. It's who we are, and we need to know that. So that was the first lesson that we basically needed to glean from Romans chapter 11, that we are not spiritual Israel. The second lesson, which I hope really comes through even more so today, is that we should take advantage of God's mercy to us by reading and believing God's word. That is a privilege that we have. And even when we, it doesn't sound right to our natural mind, or it sounds, well, that goes against what I think, or that goes against what I feel. I just need to read it and believe it. Read it and believe it and let the Holy Spirit do what he does. And, and really renew my mind to the word of God, not renew myself to the, to the world. So I hope that as we go forth today, we kind of get a little bit of, of that, just that we need to take advantage of God's mercy to us by reading and believing God's word. But there's really a third lesson that we need to learn from Romans chapter 11. And I love where we're going to be today because Paul makes a very clear cut, bold statement in, in verse 13, Romans 11, that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. So that is the third thing that we need to get down in our inner man. What does it mean that Paul is our apostle? What does it mean for us in our daily walk? What does it mean? Well, it, it means something, or he wouldn't put that scripture there. It means something significant to you and to me. So as we go forth, we do know that we are not spiritual Israel based on the first two scriptures of Romans chapter 11, but also other scriptures. 1 Samuel 12, 22, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath Pleased the Lord to make you his people. First Kings 6 13. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people, Israel. The Bible is very explicit, something I never really, I guess I knew, but roundaboutly knew, never really honed into this. But it's to certain people at certain times, it's for certain people at certain times. And as we read the word, if you read the first, especially in the, um, in the New Testament, James, for example, in the very first verse in, in the book of James, he says, James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. He lets us know exactly who he's talking to. 
So um, we glean from the book of James and, and all other books, but we understand that we glean from that what applies to us, but that word is to Israel. He specifically says it. So, but that's something I've, I've learned as I've gone through the word of God. But if you turn in your Bible with me to Romans 11, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read and kind of um, just kind of summarize, I guess, or, or for context sake, I'm going to start in verse 11, but we're going to start peeling it back in verse 13. And if you want to turn over to where we're going to be starting in the Romans book, it's going to be page 197. So right now, Romans 11, 11 through, I'm going to go through 14. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them, who? Israel to jealousy. If we were to replace Israel, there's another confirming scripture that we are not replacing Israel. We are not replacement. We would not be used to provoke them to jealousy. So salvation has come unto the Gentiles, to you and I, through their fall, uh, for to provoke them to jealousy. Verse 12, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. So this verse 13, very bold of Paul to say for I speak to you Gentiles. So we know who this is to. This is to the Gentiles. I speak to you Gentiles. In as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, pretty bold statement. You know, we have uh, in, the, in the church world today, we have a lot of people that'll stand up and say, I'm apostle so-and-so. I am prophet so-and-so. I am prophetess so-and-so. And wherever you stand on that is where you stand. But this, this is the written word of God. So the one who claims to be, I am the apostle to the Gentiles, and it is recorded in the word of God for us. This is who we absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt. It's not up to some private interpretation or private revelation that God told me that I am prophetess Karen, or I am apostle Joel or whatever. It's not, it's not that. This right here is our final and absolute authority when it comes to knowing who those people are. Because anybody, I mentioned last week, how do we know the truth from the lie? It's right here. This is the truth. And so we cannot rely on any, you know, the Book of Mormon was written by somebody who thought they were a um, John Smith. Who, what did he say he was? Whatever that was. He was the one who was given the word, the Book of Mormon. So there's a whole nother thing for them. No, that's not right. We know, we know that. You and I know that today. And we can easily detect that because we know that the word of God is our final authority. Well, when it talks about apostles, prophets, this kind of thing, we need to be no different then knowing that the word of God is our final authority. So when Paul says to us, I am your apostle, basically it's what he says. We need to understand, we need to pay attention to what he has to say because God did reveal to him by revelation, this mystery gospel, this dispensation of grace, which he is a minister for. God revealed it to him. He didn't reveal it to Joseph Smith. He didn't reveal it to, you know, any other sect or religion. 
real, revealed it to Paul and, and, and the validity of who Paul is, is important that we walk away today knowing that. It will totally change how we view God's word and how we read God's word. So page 197, Paul, where, where we're starting at 13 and 14, Paul was not one of the 12 apostles. In order to be one of the 12, he would have had to have been a believer from the time of John's baptism through Jesus's resurrection. You'll remember that they cast lots to name that apostle uh, when Judas was no more. Paul was an unbeliever persecuting the believing remnant of Israel. First Timothy 1, and, and Eric put here verse 13, but I'm going to read to you verses 12 through 16 because it's a context that we need to understand who Paul is, where he came from. And I know you know this, this will be, this will be review basically, but 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16 says this, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So let's stop right there. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me. So who enabled Paul? Christ Jesus enabled Paul. And there's a reason I am honing in on some of these very, very absolute powerful points here. So Jesus Christ enabled him for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. That is an absolute direct Christ putting him, enabling him and putting him into the ministry. Verse 13, 1 Timothy 13, 1 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now verse 16, how be it for this cause, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now, we need to understand what Paul is saying in that first Timothy passage. And if I remember correctly, and I know Scotty and I have had this conversation. So if I'm not correct, please correct me. But if I'm remembering correctly, there was a question asked on what was the last of Paul's epistles written. And I want to say the answer was Timothy. So if I'm wrong in that, Scotty, please correct me or anybody else who remembers that. So what he just said in that in verse 16 is important for us to remember. How be it for this cause, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. What does that really mean? What does that say? That means that if Timothy is the last of Paul's epistles, that would have been the completion of the word, right? So that would have been that which is perfect, completed, that which is complete, has come. So anyone that should hereafter, from that time on, me and you, from that time on, believe, we need to pay attention to this man that says he's my apostle. He's your apostle. And he was a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Those are big bullet points that the Lord Holy Spirit has just highlighted for me as I've studied this lesson. 
And I hope as you break it down and peel it back on your own time, that it's that for you too. I cannot stress enough how important and how life-changing it is. You know, I have probably gone through this Romans book with a fine tooth comb and, and I'm looking forward to doing it again because every time I redo something, I learn more. Redo these, reread. This is a great tool and resource when you accompany it with your Bible to let the sound doctrine of the word of God for the dispensation of grace to be in your inner man. That is what is your strength. That is what grows you up. So I, I encourage you to do that. So also in Acts 9 verses 4 and 5. And I have that ready. So what we were talking about is the fact that Paul was not one of the 12 apostles. He was an unbeliever, a persecutor of the believing remnant of Israel. In 1 Timothy, he just tells you he's chief. Of sinners, he is chief. So um, Acts 9, 4, and 5 say this. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I'm going to add verse 6 there. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So as Paul was in the midst of being the most zealous, zeal, he, he had it, um, a forerunner standing by at the stoning of Stephen. Um, the Lord stops him here. And Paul immediately knew this voice. This was a voice of authority. He knew that. He called him Lord. And in verse 6, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. What a powerful unfolding of the beginnings of our apostle. What a powerful thing that is recorded in the preserved word of God. It's not left to a man. It's not left for me to follow every wind and wave of apostle that claims to be an apostle i don't have to follow them i have my apostle and that is paul and he painstakingly his life was completely i said earlier before we started our lesson that the rug was yanked out from underneath us and we are just now falling to the ground and picking up pieces that are fallout from january 3rd to even today. And, and for those who don't know about, and I'll, I'll kind of um, reiterate it at the end, to culminate to landing in an ER last night with a blood pressure that was 178 over 115. That is the fallout from all of that. Paul's life was no different than that. You see that? I'm talking about the stress that I have been under and knowing that that is the culprit of What's happening to me right now? What do you think happened when Paul was sure he was doing what the Lord would have him to do? He was set out to persecute, to kill this way. And then the Lord pulled the rug out from under him. All of his beliefs, his way of life, everything, and said, Saul. Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks or the, the pricks, the pricks, not the bricks. <laughs> and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? There was something in that exchange that Paul knew this was serious. This was business. 
this man, Jesus, is more than what I thought he ever was. I want you to understand it's that Jesus that commissioned Paul to bring this mystery gospel to you and to me. So hopefully, 1 Timothy, Acts 9, we can see just in those two passages, and there are plenty more. The Lord called him in Acts 9. It is a good thing that Paul is not one of the 12 because the 12 apostles are promised to sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's in Matthew 19, 28. Therefore, if Paul was one of the 12, he could not be the apostle of the Gentiles. Why? Because Matthew says he's going to sit on the throne and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. He would still be an apostle to Israel. That's why Paul is not one of the 12. Because he's the apostle to you and me, not to Israel. So while there were other apostles to the body of Christ, after Paul was made the apostle of the Gentiles, and I want to turn here, I think maybe I wrote it down, maybe I didn't. Ephesians chapter 4. Yes, Ephesians chapter 4. No, that's a different one. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to read 11 through 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave, this is talking about that we know that there were other apostles to the body of Christ after Paul was made an apostle. So we do not cancel that out just because Paul is our apostle. There were other apostles made to the body of Christ. It says here in Ephesians 4, chapter 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body and to the edifying of itself in love. So Paul penned this for you and I, that we would understand that he is the apostle that is appointed to the Gentile. But we need to understand that in here is where other apostles, prophets have been appointed. And pastors and teachers, I am grateful for our pastors. I am grateful for our teachers. I am grateful that we have the opportunity to sit under men who are able to let the Holy Spirit work in them and through them. It's certainly Christ in them. And we are gleaning from that. So Paul wants us to understand that he has brought us the salvation, the mystery gospel of Jesus Christ. He was commissioned by Jesus himself. He had an official calling from the Lord Jesus Christ that no one else had. Why? Because a dispensation of the gospel was committed to him. Um, Jesus Christ himself revealed the mystery to Paul. Galatians 1, 11 through 12 say this. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
So Jesus Christ himself revealed the mystery to Paul. And again, in Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 4, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And verse five in that passage of Ephesians three says this, which in other ages, what does that say to you? In other ages, big highlight other times past and even ages to come. There is a direct correlation in verse five of the Ephesians chapter three, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. So right there is another direct link to, to a division in the word of God. Very revealing to me. And I just dropped my Bible, so it's probably all messed up over here. <laughs> so anyway. Page 197, continuing on. So Jesus Christ himself revealed the mystery to Paul, Galatians 1, 11 through 12, and Ephesians 3, and I used 1 through 5, appearing to him with instructions for this dispensation on multiple occasions. Another place that we need to, to highlight and read is in Acts 26. Because this is another confirming thing for this absolute thing. You remember, it's important that we understand that Paul is our apostle. What impact that makes in our life, what change it makes in our life. So he, he appeared to him with instructions for this dispensation on multiple occasions. Acts 26, verse 15 and following, he says, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now listen to verse 16 and 17. But rise, this is Jesus giving Paul instruction, and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. What purpose? To make thee a minister and witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles un, unto whom now I send thee, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's another section you need to underline by faith that is in yourself, by faith that is in someone else, by faith, Jesus says, that is in me. So that we've talked so much through these months about the faith of Christ and that wonderful exchange that is my faith bringing me to him, then him exchanging my faith for his, that no more do I have to rely on me, but I rely on him. It's his faith. This is another place, Acts 26, 18, the latter part, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Jesus's faith. Amazing to me. Because this dispensation, the dispensation of grace, is the primary dispensation in which the Gentiles are saved, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, Christianity, and I have heard people say this, especially when referring to Paul, will claim that Paul's statement here is egotistical. As a matter of fact, they'll take some of the writings 
you know, the, the grace of God. And because Paul's ministry is all about grace, you can't get around it. But there are many out there that will take that grace of God and say, well, you just want to be one of those that slip in by that greasy slope of grace that everything's okay and there's nothing going to keep you from heaven. But that's not the case. Paul's not being egotistical here. He's not being, you know, um, profaning the name of God, the, the grace of God. The opposite is actually true. The fact that God only needed one apostle for the body of Christ as opposed to 12 in Israel, Israel's program shows that the Lord Jesus Christ did indeed triumph over Satan's forces with the cross. Before the cross, it was different. After the cross, we have a whole new ball game, so to speak. The inning has changed. It's a whole new ball game. And um, he didn't need the 12 apostles for the dispensation of grace. That's why he named Paul the apostle. That's also why um, in the word, we're told that Peter then becomes the apostle of the circumcision and Paul, the apostle of the uncircumcision, distinctive lines, cutting straight those lines. That's what to divide means, to cut it straight. There's no jaggedness. So all this shows that Christ did indeed triumph over Satan's forces with the cross and received all power in heaven and earth as a result. And we're told that in Matthew 28, 18, where he has given all power, Christ is, in heaven and earth. Therefore, Paul's statement here speaks of God's power, not of Paul's pride. You remember last week, we touched on filthy rags righteousness. Filthy rags righteousness is rooted in self, self-accomplishment, um, self-made. Look at me. It's about me shining my light, not the light of Christ coming through me. Paul would be accused of that, you know, being boastful and prideful. But this is not rooted in the pride of Paul. We've just established fact, biblical fact, that Jesus Christ himself called Paul to be the apostle of the Gentiles. We've established that. There's no way around it. So his statement speaks more of God's power, not of his pride. Because of the Lord's, um, uh, Lord Jesus Christ's omnipotence, and we read these verses earlier in 1 Timothy 6, 14 through 16, he sent Paul to Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel in Acts 9, 15. Recognizing this, Paul magnifies his office. I'm going to talk about that for a second from being the apostle of the Gentiles in hopes that it will include Israel. Note that Paul does not say he magnifies himself. He magnifies his office. And back in Romans 11, verse 13, that's indeed exactly what he says. For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my office. He takes it seriously and he understands the impact. If you magnify something, you make it bigger. He understands the magnitude, the bigness of the impact of this statement. And it's no surprise that many in the church today don't even know that. I never even realized, I'm 56 years old, and I never even realized, and call it my own ignorance, that Paul was appointed as the apostle to the Gentiles. And I've read Romans before, but I just water skied across that, didn't take root in my life whatsoever. It was just, okay, I get it. Well, I didn't really get it. Paul magnifies this statement because it's that big. It's that big. It's not about magnifying himself. For we know how he lived his life as a follower of Jesus Christ. We know he penned every one of these epistles that are directly to us. 
We know his sufferings. We know that three times he asked the Lord to remove a thorn in his flesh, the messenger of Satan that was there to buffet him. And buffet is to constantly hit, 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 hit. Earlier, before we all got on, I said, sometimes it, it's like a double punch that's going on in my life right now. Well, a messenger of Satan that Paul had to buffet, it's a constant hit, 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 hit. So what I'm going through is not that. I'm, I'm being hit, you know, maybe sucker punch sometimes, but it's not that constant buffeting, 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 buffeting. But the answer to Paul in that is my answer even today. My grace is sufficient for thee. So Paul is not magnifying himself. To magnify himself would be to make himself, maybe his life a little easier. I don't know. He's not doing that. He magnifies his office. And he does that because it's so impactful. What did we read earlier? That those who shall believe hereafter, Paul knew that the hereafter, which is where we are now, what are we reading today hereafter? We're reading the epistles that are penned by Paul, all of them actually. But right now we're focusing on Paul. The hereafter is you and I. He knew that the magnification of his office was important because it was a big deal. So it's not his pride. It's not his big head. Paul magnifies his office from being the apostle of the Gentiles in hopes that it will include Israel. Paul does not say that he magnifies himself. He magnifies his office. On the bottom of page 197, in other words, the Lord Jesus Christ sent Paul to both Gentiles and Jews, but he is only the apostle of the Gentiles because the Gentiles are going to be saved in this dispensation while the Israel will be saved after the rapture. And that is, we're going to, we're going to cover that as we get further in uh, Romans chapter 11. At the end of his ministry to the Jews, Paul said that his ministry fulfilled Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. I want to go there quickly. And I hope that I'm not redundant in bringing out these scriptures. I just think it was so important for me as I began to grasp the magnitude of what all this is and why should I be focusing on Paul's epistles? Why should I even realize that he's writing to me? Th this is all to hone this in. So Isaiah 6 verses 9 through 10. Paul said that his ministry fulfilled this and we're going to reiterate this in just a minute in some other scriptures. Isaiah 6, 9 through 10, and he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. That's the scripture that Paul said his ministry fulfilled, in that he was sent by God to the Jews, to preach the gospel to them. Remember, when Paul was first commissioned, he was sent to the Jews first, to kings and to Gentiles, but to the Jews first. And he tells us that over and over in his epistle, in Romans, actually. But they could not hear, the Jews could not hear and understand that message because the heart of this people is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Now, if you'll go to Acts now from Isaiah, go to Acts 28. And I apologize for the jumping around again, but I hope, I hope it's painting this picture for you as it did for me. Acts 28. And we're going to read 27 and 28. Verse 27, for the heart of this people is waxed gross. 
and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts uh, and should be converted and I should heal them. Verse 28, be it known therefore unto you that salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And I'm going to go ahead and finish that. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So in that verse 28, be it known therefore unto you that salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. So when Paul was commissioned in Acts chapter 9, after the stoning of Stephen, we kind of outlined last week, that was a very clear distinction of when that program of Israel was set aside. Paul was commissioned. All of these things took place and happened, but culminating into the very end result, which salvation is now to you and to me. Not that we don't share salvation with the Jew, because we do. And we're going to understand that as we proceed forth as well, because the hope, our hope is the same as Paul's, that they will hear, they will understand, and they will be saved. Isn't that what he said earlier? My heart's desire my prayer and heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. That's Romans 10.1. So we've already gone over that one. So this occurred. Why did they wax gross? Why did they, uh, their ears, the ears have become dull of hearing and their eyes closed? It happened when they rejected their Messiah. And that's in John 12, verses 37 through 40. The fact that Paul calls himself the apostle of the Gentiles, then even though he went to the Jews is a clue that Paul knew all along that the Jews would not believe the mystery gospel. You have to keep in mind that what Paul brought to us was given to him by revelation of Jesus Christ, not by man. So Jesus Christ, I'm sure, revealed to Paul more of how this thing was going to play out. Nevertheless, remembering Paul's desire is for Israel to be saved. Therefore, he magnifies his office, which means he draws attention to it. By drawing attention to it, he hopes that he will provoke Israel to emulate the Gentiles. That's what verse 14 in Romans chapter 11 says. Romans eleven fourteen. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, Jews, and might save some of them. Okay? Well, let's see why he wants to do that. So, Paul knows that if all of Israel will not be saved um, until after the rapture, but if he magnifies the fact that God has set aside Israel's program, and is saving Gentiles now, he may provoke some Jews to believe the gospel of grace so that they, so that at least some of them will be part of the body of Christ. When you think about it, calling Paul to be the apostle of the Gentiles is the ultimate slap in the face for Israel. Think about that, truly. Spiritually speaking, the Pharisees were as low as you could go. Jesus said they were the children of the devil in John 8, 44, who spent their lives making the next generation of Pharisees twofold the children of hell that they were, Matthew 23, 15. Jesus called them serpents. He called them a generation of vipers that had no capacity to escape the damnation of hell, Matthew 23, 33. Meanwhile, Paul was a Pharisee. We read in 1 Timothy, his accolade of himself, his resume, so to speak. I did this, I did that. Of sinners, I am chief. So he was the worst of them. He persecuted the church of God. He wasted it and profited in the religion 
in that religion, what religion? The Jewish Pharisaical religion above many of the other Pharisees. Why? Because he was more zealous of, of, of the Pharisees' religion. That's in Galatians 1, 13 through 14. This made him the chief of sinners that we read earlier in 1 Timothy 1, 15, such that he was not even fit to be called an apostle. But yet, Jesus Christ calls him out and tells him what he is going to be. There's a lot to glean in that for you and I. But God's grace came along, gave him eternal life in heavenly places, and made him God's apostle to the Gentiles. What should this teach Israel? What this should teach Israel is that their religion will lead them to the deepest part of hell. But God's grace can exalt them to a high position in heavenly places. You and I are partakers already of eternal life in heavenly places. We're already partakers of that by our believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the atonement of our sin. The word clearly speaks that our inheritance is in heaven. So that, that reward being heavenly places will be our dwelling. That is what Paul wants for Israel. Some will believe even today, but they have been ears have been dulled and their eyes have been blinded that the Bible says they cannot believe. So what's more, God has called Israel to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles. And we know that based on Exodus 19, five and six. And uh, first Peter talks about being called to be uh, priests. 1500 years have passed. And not only had Israel not become that kingdom of priests, but they also were not even going to be part of God's kingdom, Matthew 5, 20. And I want to go there for just a second because I want, you know, it's one thing to hear it being read by another person's penmanship, but it's another thing when you read it out of the penmanship in the word of God. Matthew 5, verse 20 says this, and this is Jesus speaking, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So not only have they not become the kingdom of priests that they were supposed to be, they're, not, they're also not going to be part of God's kingdom according to that scripture, Matthew 5, 20. Then God's grace is shown to Paul and by himself, he is leading the Gentiles into God's kingdom. This should show Israel that they should emulate Paul by abandoning the Jewish religion and believing the gospel of grace. You know, one of the things that this coming week that I'll be spending in California is so important for. And, you know, please pray for me because this will be a time that I haven't had in a very long time with my oldest son to be with him exclusive and my, my sweet and precious grandbaby. But I raised my children in religion. I raised them in religion. And I know that I have to let the doors open. I can't charge the door. I have to let the doors open in conversation and be ready to just gracefully walk through dispensing grace. Because my son, while they were taught grace, it was taught very differently, that it was yours today, but tomorrow would not be yours because it was a religion based on performance. And I want to I want to share something with you based on that real quickly in Philippians 1, 6. You probably already know the scripture, but I want to pull it out right here in this conversation because Philippians 1, 6, and this is another reason it's so important. The version of the Bible you use, so important. I never got it. Philippians 1, 6 says this, and this was one of my bedpost kind of scriptures. You know, I'd hang this on my bedpost being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it 
until the day of Jesus Christ. This scripture right here, if you are thinking that it's about you and your works and your performance, which I have taught for many a year, be free from that because that scripture right there says he will perform it. He will. Other versions of the Bible do not use that word. They have changed that word perform to something else. Taking the emphasis off of him and placing it on you. I can't perform it. Only he can. That's another nugget right there in this dispensation of grace. So as I go to California, I am prayerful that the Lord would open those doors in conversation with my oldest son who had a relationship with religion, which as we see, as Jesus described it himself, the religion of the Pharisees was of the devil. And that's what religion is, is of the devil. But relationship, freedom in Christ, when we fully understand that it's all him and not me, I'm no longer walking in defeat. I'm walking in victory. And that's where uh, prayerfully I am going to be able to have conversation, just sweet aromas of conversation with my son to set him free from that religion of defeat and introduce him to victorious Jesus who shall perform the good work. It's not about our performance, it's about his. So God had already given the sign gifts to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. Now Paul tries to provoke Israel even further by magnifying his office as the apostle of the Gentiles so that at least some of the Jews might see that religion gets them help. Religion gets them help while faith in God gets them heaven. And we pray that that is truly many, many more will believe. Now, we're turning the page to 199. We're going to go on to uh, verse 15. So to get back in our context, Romans 11, verse 13 through 15. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Verse 15, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Let's see what that means. We see why Paul had such a great desire for Israel to be saved. They were his people. He was one of them. By Gail. It was not just because he was a Jew but it was also because Paul understood the entire plan of God. How and why did he understand that? Because it was given to him by revelation. He understood the entire plan of God. God's plan, as we have already seen, was to start the nation of Israel and to punish them for their wickedness. Why? So that the Gentiles would fear God. Then God set Israel's program, um, Israel's wickedness, God set aside Israel's wickedness so that, the, so that the Gentiles would fear God. Then God set aside Israel's program and offered grace to the Gentiles for them to be saved. Once the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, when we get to verse 25, we're going to read that because that's where it says, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So why has Israel been set aside for this moment? 
in part so that the fullness of the Gentiles, so that you and I, all that would believe hereafter, could be saved by faith, grace through faith. God will resume Israel's program again, and all Israel shall be saved. When they see the salvation that God gave the Gentiles at the rapture, the hope and the prayer is that Israel is going to be awakened, kind of like Paul was awakened on that road when he was blinded, but then he was able to see clearly. That is the, the, the hope. Paul knows that that's how it's going to happen, basically. Israel will then be God's kingdom of priests to the Gentiles. After that, the dispensation of the fullness of times will begin when all things will be reconciled to God. When we started this study way back in Romans 1, one of the things that was brought out was that God created two realms. God created in Genesis 1, the heaven and the earth. So he created two realms. And now we're far enough along that we are learning about his desire to reconcile all things to him. That means the heaven and the earth. But it has to unfold in a certain way in order for that to happen. And so blindness in part has been given to Israel today so that this part of it can happen. The fullness of the Gentiles can come in. So. Um, Ephesians 1.10 says this, and you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you unless you want to. Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Then uh, Ephesians 3.15 says this, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So I want to stop right there for just a second. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth. So Gentiles and Jews. Jesus, a lot of people will say, um, Kathy in, in um, Louisiana brought out a little book earlier before we got started, and it's called Jesus Wasn't Talking to You. And a lot of people will look at the title of that book, and I, I, I agree, it's kind of a, an offensive little title, especially when you come from a red letter background, and every word of Jesus means something, and it does, but we have to put things in its proper context. But right here, we need to understand that neither now nor then is anybody trying to say that Jesus is not for you. Because Jesus is for you. All, the whole family in heaven and earth is named by him. So we need to remember that. And then Colossians 1.20 says this. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. That signifies or magnifies the fact that there are two realms, the heaven and the earth. Eventually, both will be reconciled to God. Paul is looking at this ultimate goal of having all reconciled back to God. He recognizes that if he can provoke at least some Jews to emulate him, they will be saved as part of the body of Christ. Because remember, those who are saved in the dispensation of grace are saved as part of the body of Christ. They're saved the same way you and I are, grace through faith. This may snowball into uh, all of Israel being saved, since that takes place after Israel's program starts up. Now remember, this is thinking about Paul's, Paul's mind. Paul can hasten the rapture of the body of Christ if Israel's salvation starts now. Remember us saying that he magnifies his office because what he has to say is big. Um, I oftentimes get caught up in a lot of activity and everything may be important. And, but then I find myself 
jumping from thing to thing to thing to thing. Many times when I'm trying to share something that is new to me or something that has impacted my life, I just want to get it all out and, and make sure that it's all out and that, that we can all be on the same page and we can all understand it and all, you know, believe it the same way or uh, enjoy it the same. Well, in a way, if you think about Paul, and, and it says here, Paul can hasten the rapture of the body of Christ if Israel's salvation starts now. For him to say he magnifies his office, all of that is kind of along that line. He wants so much for his people Israel to be saved because he knows what the rest of the story is going to be. So if he can get this going, we can get this going quickly, then we'll be done with this. We'll just all be where we need to be and life will be good. In other words, Paul wants Israel to be saved because their salvation means that the Gentiles have already been saved. The heavenly places would be reconciled back to God and God's kingdom on earth can begin with both Jews and Gentiles blessed in God's earthly kingdom. So when the church is raptured, it's Jew, Gentile, you know, at this dispensation, there is ne neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female. So, but when the church is raptured, we cannot be ignorant that some of the Gentiles will be left on the earth. And of course, we know the Jews will be. So it will be a Jews and Gentiles to be blessed in God's earthly kingdom for their inheritance is the earth. Therefore, Paul does not just want Israel to be saved so that they can have eternal life, but he also wants them to be saved because it means Satan and his forces being destroyed forever and God ruling over all heaven and earth. Isn't that what we all kind of want? That Satan and his forces would be destroyed forever? I think that's why for me, and I know for, for you, I, I speak for all of us, I think it's so important that, yes, Sylvia, what a day that will be. What a glorious day that will be. Um, I speak for us when I say that um, we just are ready. You know, I had somebody call me today and uh, concerned about me flying out on Saturday and because of the mess that the airlines are in and they can't find pilots and they can't this. And she said, I think I would be looking for a bus or a train or whatever. And I'm thinking, well, I don't even watch the news, so I'm not even keeping up with all of that. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to go with it. And, you know, what happens, happens, and I'll be fine. But I am so ready that Satan and his forces be destroyed forever. That this fallen world be as God created it to be, not corrupted with sin, not fallen. To understand this better, better, we will look at a similar situation in Matthew 3, 5 through 6, says that many Jews came to John in the wilderness to be baptized by him. John is often called the Baptist, John the Baptist, because of he was the baptizer, John the baptizer. However, John did not baptize everyone who came to him. He told the Pharisees that before he would baptize them, they needed to bring fruit, forth fruit meet for repentance, Matthew 3, 8. But Matthew 3 focuses on him baptizing people because repentance plus baptism equals salvation in Acts 2, 38. There's another distinctive line right there. Now it's not repentance plus baptism. Now it's believing that Jesus died his death burial and resurrection as the atonement for our sin but back here it meant salvation baptism at repentance plus baptism equaled salvation therefore if john baptized them they must have repented first that's why when it says they needed to bring therefore fruits meat for repentance the pharisees were not about that they were about their own kingdom, 
their own way, their own, you know, I have the oracle of God, I have the law of God, but I don't have to do anything. They were all about themselves. That's why John refused to baptize many of them because they would not repent. And the word says they needed to bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. If they did that, then John would baptize them because repentance is the fruit. Baptism, repentance and baptism equaled salvation for them. Similarly, in Romans chapter 11, verse 15, Paul is looking toward the end. Although he is the apostle of the Gentiles, as he told us in verse 13, his message is saving the Gentiles. His heart's desire is for Israel to be saved because that means that the fullness of the Gentiles has also come in. And we'll get to that point in verses 25 and 26, meaning that Satan's rule will soon be over. You know, I think sometimes, do they ever have a clue what today would look like? You know, I think when we look at today, we see every generation thinks, how can we get worse? How can things get worse? Um, I wonder if they thought that then too. Probably so. But in the words of Romans eleven fifteen, 15, since the casting away of Israel meant the reconciling of the world back to God through the dispensation of grace, the receiving of Israel means so much more. It means life from the dead for Israel in God's kingdom on earth. In other words, if Paul can get the salvation ball rolling with Israel, it means that the rapture of the body of Christ will soon happen because Israel's salvation as a whole takes place after the body of Christ is raptured up. And the word supports that. So getting Jews saved means that God can wrap things up quicker because Israel's salvation is the last piece of the puzzle before Jesus' second coming. You know, we've been putting together a puzzle for quite some time. And I believe that this is correct, the last piece of the puzzle. I cannot, you know, my kids used to leave the puzzle on the table. They would stay up late. And finish the whole puzzle because we put puzzles together every year at the holiday time. And they would step late, late, late. I used to get hang with them, but I can't do it anymore. So they would put that puzzle all together and they would leave one piece out for me to put in that I would always get to put that last piece. Well, you know, when you think about it like that, the last piece of the puzzle is Israel's salvation. That's not as a whole. That's not going to happen until the body of Christ, you and I are raptured out of here. But when that happens, that last piece of the puzzle can be placed. Can you imagine, Sylvia said, what a, what a, what a joy that would be. Can you imagine what joy that is going to be? If Israel is saved, God's kingdom on earth will start. Death will be swallowed up in victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, and God will rule over both heaven and earth for all eternity. I said to these two ladies, these precious ladies I got to spend time with in Iowa, you know, the 84-year-old asked me, because I've shared every month just little bits about Right Division. They're, They're from two very different backgrounds, which is different from me, but you just plant the seed. You just you know, every, every month. And one of them's 84, one of them's 78. And I can't even remember when I shared this with her, but um, she said, you know, you mentioned to us one time about times past, but now and ages to come. And she, she had it written down and she said, I'm just kind of wondering about that. And I'm like, how How sweet was that to be able to talk to her about that time past, but now, because someone told her they questioned righteousness and that she was not righteous. She did not have righteousness. 
And so I was able to share with her that our righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. And when we believe in his death, burial, resurrection as the atonement of our sin, we are no longer clothed with that filthy rags righteousness. Somebody tried to put her back in that filthy rags righteousness. I said, you're not wearing that. No, you are wearing the righteousness of Christ. For you have said to me that you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's but now. That's but now. And I was able to share the, the scripture with her concerning that. And I just felt so privileged and so blessed to be able to do that. But that's why Paul says that the receiving of Israel means so much more than them being cast away. Their diminishing meant that you and I could have this time, the dispensation of grace, to come into salvation. But when they are um, received once again, it means so much more than them being cast away because it means that everything, everything, heaven and earth is reconciled back to God. It means everything. So we're going to stop there today. And I just wrote glory, hallelujah, in my, in my book right there. I hope that we've so far discovered that we are not spiritual Israel. It's evident when he refers to them continuously as his people. He has not cast them away. He's using us to provoke them to jealousy. I hope that as we've talked about some of the blessings of believing the gospel, that we have begun to understand and unfold the part of taking advantage of the mercy of God that is offered to us today and how important that is. I hope that as we've unfolded and opened a lot of scripture today about who Paul is, how he got to be where he is, he wasn't appointed by man. It's not his prideful ego that says, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. He didn't magnify himself, puff himself up. He magnified the office. And he went through a lot to do that. He went through a lot. Romans through Philemon. And if you want to read even more, start reading in Acts chapter 9. He went through a lot from Acts chapter 9 through Philemon in his office. And he did it for you and for me. That everyone for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter Believe on him to life everlasting. That is why he did it. So I hope as you close the study today, even as whatever you've gleaned, I hope you've gleaned that, that Paul is the apostle appointed by Jesus Christ. We so readily, and I say this not really for anybody on this call, but for myself, we so readily um, except everybody else that calls themselves, labels themselves. But yet when it comes to believing that the epistles of Paul are written to us, we have a hard time grasping them because I don't know why. How can I believe someone I don't even know who's not recorded in the inspired word of God and lay that on the shelf and believe others. And that was a revelation to me. And I say that as, as credit. I got an email yesterday from someone giving some encouragement. And, and it was Eric. And I answered him back and I said, you know, thank you so much for your encouraging words. Because... 
there was a time in my life that uh, I didn't so readily, thought I did, but I didn't so readily just read and believe God's word. Now I know all the books on the shelf can fill this room and none of them are more important or more valuable than this one. Not one of them. So I hope if you're on the fence or you're trying to decide, is Paul truly my apostle? Is his word to me? I hope that the enough scripture has been bathed over this today that you see that. Father, we come to you at the close of this study today, and I thank you for my sisters. I thank you that they fervently pray, not just for me, but for each other. Father, that they take the words of your book as life everlasting. And that there's such zeal within them, Lord, that they want others to know it. So, Father, I pray and thank you for Christ in them. As I see it, because they are Christ in them is also Christ to me. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for our knitting together. I thank you for your infinite wisdom. From the foundation of the world, that one day, we would be sitting here together, talking about your word, loving you more and more every day, and knowing the gift that we have. Father, as we set out this day, I want to be mindful of everyone on this call that has family, friends, loved ones in any capacity in their life, Lord, that need salvation that need to know you. Father, I pray that the circumstances will be thus, that salvation can be shared, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their hearts would be open and that they would receive that and believe it. And Father, I pray that for each and every family member that is represented on this study. Go with us today as we depart and help us to magnify you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.